Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and I'm going to tell you about flying the A-37. I've got some time in this aircraft. I flew it in the reserves, which is where more, most of them were placed after the Vietnam War. And uh, I'm going to tell you about the Dragonfly. Well, most pilots didn't like calling it the Dragonfly, you know, especially when you had other fighters out there called Phantoms. Uh, Eagles hadn't come along yet, but they were coming. But anyway, um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, Raptor, things like that. It's, it's not the best name. So we, we called it the Super Tweet. But first of all, um, this airplane was developed. Uh, first flight was in October of 1964. They were produced from 63 to 75. And it weighs roughly twice as much as the T-37, which was uh, the aircraft the design came directly off of. And one interesting little fact, it cost a quarter of the price of the F-4 Phantom at the time, and it could haul 5,800 pounds of external ordnance. Now, what you see under the wings there, those aren't bombs, unless you do a, a, a jettison, uh, they can become bombs, and that's not a good thing to do. Uh, but they're not the they're not the bombs. There are extra fuel tanks because that J-85 uh, chews up a lot of gas, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Because when you when you take and you double the size of the aircraft, you need a little more interesting thrust, and there, uh, more thrust. There's an interesting story there, but first, let me tell you about the lore of being a fighter pilot. I know there are a few fighter pilots on, so this is old hat, but for the rest of you, you might find this interesting. All right, go, being a fighter pilot goes back to the time when the world was not even colorized. I mean, these are some British fighter pilots in a pub having a good draw there. Uh, Fighter pilots tend to be a little crazy, wild, stuff like that. You know, uh, on the right side is some wild weasel guys, and they were probably the wildest of the fighter pilots because when you go out and you try to engage an enemy SAM site uh, to shoot it down, that's, um, you know, or to blow it up, they were trying to shoot you down, uh, That that's pretty aggressive, and some of these guys flew pretty aggressively. Uh, they were There was a base out at George next to Edwards Flight Test Center when I was out there, and these guys... Uh, yeah. Anyway, and they converted to the uh, F4G uh, model, I believe it was, from the F105. When I was out there, they are still flying uh, 105s, but I digress. But I'm already digressing, so here we go. All right, you go into any fighter pilot bar in the world, bar none, any fighter pilot bar in the world, and you slam down your fist, and you announce loudly that you are the second greatest fighter pilot in the world and everybody will kind of look at you and go yeah yeah whatever you know because they know that they are the best fighter pilots in the world okay now two other things if you're a brand new t-37 instructor and you've got your little uh pocket there with your uh emergency uh red knife that's uh tucked in there on your flight suit well Fighter pilots don't have that because their knife's on the G-suit. So I'll tell you right now, you don't want to walk into a fighter pilot bar uh, with that thing hanging because you won't walk out with it. And I, I found that as a second lieutenant, unfortunately, when I went into the Nellis bar um, in the mid-70s. Now, um, I was on a cross-country. I went in there, and I'm sitting with some guys. We're having a few brews there, and all of a sudden, somebody stands up and says, Hark! I believe I see the carcass of a deceased insect! And then he yells, Dead Bug! And the deal is, everybody has to get on the floor, uh, put their arms and legs up and twiddle like that, uh, or the last guy down has to buy a round. And I didn't quite know what was going on, and my whole table was going down, and I'm going, what? And this guy grabs my flight suit, pulls me off the chair onto the floor. He says, you don't want to buy the whole place of beer, you know? So, I learned that real quick. Okay, that's one fighter pilot thing. Now, um, the, uh, the, the other thing is you don't want to necessarily go into Nellis. Well, actually I went to Nellis in the late, uh, seventies and they had started cra cracking down on alcohol on base with pilots and, uh, the place was empty. I couldn't believe it because the Nellis bars, they would have several of, I mean, it was a great place. It was wild. It was fun. It was fantastic. I went there and it was absolutely dead. And the bartender says, yeah, since they cracked down, everybody's gone into town. And since I didn't have transportation, I was stuck with me and the bartender. Anyway, digress on my digressing. But uh, the point is, you don't go into the fighter pilot bar and announce that you are a dragonfly pilot. Now, you might go in uh, with a bunch of army dudes in one of their bars because they're, they're going to like you because there was a tiered structure here. The army helicopters had like from zero to 400 feet. The A-37s, which were good for 
close uh, air support, uh, had 400 feet to 1,000, and then the fast movers, the F4s and stuff, were above 1,000. So we had our little own little airspace that we operated out of there, and uh, we could get in. So I'll tell you about that on, on about using the gun on this aircraft and uh, strafing and stuff like that, strafing and bombing. This aircraft could really be in tight and in close and accurate. Now, one thing about uh, the T the A-37 and the T-37. Uh, until just recently, if you were an Air Force pilot, you had learned to fly in the T-37. Now, I know there's probably some old guys out there and go, well, we learned on the T-33. Okay, that's before. Okay, but you learned on the T-37, so you knew how to fly it, and uh, you, were, you were very familiar with uh, the aircraft. So uh, the A-37 being a derivative fit very nicely, but there were a few problems with the T, other than being a 6,000-pound dog whistle, which was one of the problems. Okay, that J-69 engine. I told my students that were going to F-4s that uh, think of me when you start because there's a Plust unit that provides air to the uh, uh, F-4 to start it, and it uses one of these, uh, the engine he'd been flying. So when you see this engine, think of me. Now, this, in some respects, was a great engine. Uh, you could put ice in it, and with that centrifugal compressor, it would just chop up ice. It didn't care. But it took up to 18 seconds to accelerate from idle, which uh, was one reason you had to spool it up. And if you pulled it to idle, and then you wanted to go around for the, from the flare, which I did one time due to a hydroplaning incident, which I talk in some of the instructor videos I've done, uh, you got a long ways to go. All right, so here's the J85 engine. Now, this engine is the same engine that's used on the T38, but uh, uh, the input there is uh, shown on the left there, and it's got these little blades. They look like this. They're nice little blades. This is one of the front compressor blades, but the problem with the T38 is it doesn't like ice, and it also doesn't like any sort of thing uh, that might get in there and uh, damage the blade like a bolt. That will cause you a just world of hurt and cut your thrust in about half if you're lucky. So it's a little more sensitive to that sort of thing. But, okay, on the T-37, that J-69 put out 1,025 pounds of thrust. Okay, you go to the T-38, and it's 2,050 pounds of thrust. And I found out there are a lot of versions of the J-85. I hadn't realized there were so many uh, versions. Um, the one on the T-38 is the J-85-5A, and the one on the A-37 is the J-85-17A. Okay, so we take the T-38 J-85 engine, and in non-afterburner, it puts out 2,050 pounds. In afterburner, it puts out 2,900 pounds. So I'm reading the dash one on the uh, the T-38, and I go, I mean, on the A-37, and I see uh, 2,850 pounds. And I go, no, nah, that's a misprint, because that's what you get in the T-38 on the J-85 in afterburner. And uh, it's just 2,000 pounds, uh, not an afterburner. And they go, nope, nope, that's not an error. And I go, really? And yeah, in the T-38, you've got that long duct that leads into the engine. It's about 12 feet long. And with the B to the C model, they made some improvements, which actually, and I might do one on this later, they kind of rushed the test program. They screwed it up. Uh, and they found out later they had a few problems with transonic spikes causing some issues into the engine and stuff like that. And it dumbed it down. Uh, yeah, it's more fuel efficient, but uh, the guys don't get to go supersonic, or girls, on the dollar ride, which I think really sucks. Because that was, you know, the first time I went supersonic with only having 200 total hours of flight time. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, but here we go. Um, so that duct loss causes cost you about a thousand pounds of thrust out of the engine i was actually amazed at that uh so yeah this thing had 2850 so together we had almost 6,000 pounds of thrust on a 12,000 pound aircraft i know it's not an eagle here but uh and that's an impressive aircraft to fly let me tell you but it's not an eagle okay but uh that was pretty cool especially a lot of times we flew it uh, with uh, very little load. We would have the practice bluey bombs, which I'll tell you about later. But if, you know, mo most of the time we flew not that heavy. So this thing was a great performer. I went around one time on short final at a quarter mile out, climbed up, hit pattern altitude over the numbers and pitched out. Uh, some guy in a 150 was a little slow getting out of, off the runway there and I had to go around. All right. So, um, yeah, it's a powerful engine, and until you put the actual bombs on it, then it became a different issue. The air, it was sluggish. Uh, you could get into ground vibrational modes because uh, of the, all the 
crap you had hanging. So it was, it was interesting. And there's one other interesting factor on this engine. Okay, you're setting there low to the ground. So you see that little yellow arrow there? That's uh, screens. And those screens come up in front of the engine uh, to keep you from sucking up uh, FOD, foreign object damage uh, stuff, to, in an effort to protect the engine. Well, as soon as you lift off, those screens retract. And it's funny, it's like you get a little kick. Uh, it, we, we called it the mini afterburners because when those things uh, kick off, away you go and uh, you got a little more thrust. The other thing is when you kind of put your hand over the canopy rail there, uh, you got to be careful. You don't want to lose your glove or your hand because uh, there's a lot of suction. That, that guy sucks in a lot, a lot of air. Now, the first time I got to fly the A-37 before I got in the fighter unit was out at Edwards Air Force Base. That's me standing there. And uh, guys who know Edwards, they go, "Whoa, that's the old control tower. And yes, it is. I was back there in the, uh, you know, the early ages. And there's actually a T-33 back there and an F-111. We had four F-111s, and we're lucky if we kept two flying at any one time. Building 1600 there. I'm digressing. But anyway, that's when I got to fly the A-37. Because being the senior flight examiner in Stanovel, we had this deal where we could go out and get people check rides okay well i could give them in i was a t-38 senior flight examiner so i gave people check rides in the t-38 but they had this deal that we could give a check ride in any aircraft even though we weren't qualified on it and i wasn't qualified on the a-37 other than having flown the t uh but we could give them a check ride to make sure they were using the checklist properly well this was just a reason to get a flight you had to have a reason to get a flight in the air force you couldn't just walk up and say hey i'd like to fly in your airplane so you had to have a reason and that was a legitimate reason and of course you know we were a, a tight group out at edwards and uh, i would just ask one of my friends i said hey i'd like to fly the a37 or the f4 or something like that you know and they go okay we can do that um we'll set up this check ride you know and it's kind of like wink wink check ride and make sure you're uh using the checklist you know and everybody knew it wasn't really a check ride uh and a lot of them didn't use the checklist very um religiously at least uh for walk arounds and stuff like that which i always thought was ridiculous anyway i'm digressing but anyway so that's how i got to fly the a37 uh, initially now here is the a37 and it was used in uh the test pilot school for spin training and uh the interesting thing about uh, that photograph is in the white coat that's my wife and in the uh, stroller there, that's my daughter, Lori, leaning forward. And my wife is holding up Mark, who's now a uh, 777 pilot at United, like I was, uh, looking into the cockpit. And uh, you can see they still have the little blibbit on the nose there uh, for the gun. And those white tanks, of course, are fuel tanks. And they had little extra stations where they could put on other fun stuff if they were going to do, uh, you know, any uh, demonstration of bomb qualification, something like that. Of course, this replaced the old T-33, and I have a video about a very interesting story about naming and defacing that aircraft and stuff like that. Uh, it's got a kind of an interesting history that I think a lot of the uh, test pilot school students may not be aware of as far as, uh, it says Captain Tom Stafford on it now, but it, it started out with Lieutenant Colonel Stroop, and uh, yeah, I go into that in another video. But anyway, okay, here's, here's one reason why the A-37... Uh, got a lot of good play. Okay, the A-1 Sandy. This was used in Vietnam, and uh, one of my fellow uh, flight instructors in Sea Flight Advance, Captain Bazine, a good old Texas boy and quite quite a character, uh, just, just quite a character, but he was an A-1 Sandy pilot in Vietnam. And uh, this airplane was great. It could carry a bunch of stuff. Look at all that stuff it could carry. But uh, the Air Force said, ah, we got a problem training these pilots to fly this. And uh, you, you tail dragger pilots out there, and my Great Lakes fellow uh, pilots will get a kick out of this. They had trouble training these pilots because it was first a tail dragger, and it had a round engine, a radial engine. Of course, we all know radial engines take just a little bit more care and feeding. So they go, hmm, well, that's a little bit of a problem checking people out in this aircraft. 
Well, you go back to the T-37, of course, everybody flies that. It's a jet. You don't have to worry about P-factor. You don't have to worry about manifold pressure and bringing it up too soon and rolling the thing on takeoff or applying power at too slow airspeed on a go-around and rolling the thing over like, you know, was a issue with the P-51s uh, because it's got a big prop and a big engine. And, uh, you know, if you're not, if you haven't flown props and big engines, that can be a problem. So that was one of the issues they had to watch out for. And, okay. So they made the A37. And here it is. Now, I don't recommend this because you want to have skin on the aircraft. You fly it like this, and uh, uh, it's just not going to work well. Uh, you're not going to develop lift. And I don't know why anybody would have an airplane like this. But anyway, that shows a lot of the things you can put on the A37. And there are a lot of things you can put on the A37. It can carry just a plethora of uh, weapons and bombs and it even had a, an extra little gun you could put on the thing and supposedly you could have a 20 or even a 30 millimeter gun that would have been something a 37 with a 30 millimeter gun on it but uh, anyway uh, you had a load of stuff and of course being a pilot on this in peacetime you had to uh, maintain currency and all the different dive angles and weapon systems and that. And one of my jobs was to track people's currency. And boy, did that, did that get to be a problem. But okay, I'm getting a local checkout. Um, I'm in the reserves and we go down to Savannah, Georgia, and we go down to the range. And, um, you know, being the reserves, it was kind of, you know, a uh, little more loose. And I got kind of a, you know, got kind of a briefing at the bar and we're going to go up and we're going to drop bombs. And he tells me how to, you know, how this is all going to work, the five degree, the 30 degree, stuff like that. Well, we start out at five degrees and uh, I, I calculate the uh, the bomb release point there and the altitude and stuff like that. Um but I made a slight error. So on my first bombing run, now I knew we had this target. Uh, it was called a shack, um, which I didn't think of it at the time. That was the name. But um, I, I, I had read that uh, you were told about your error from, you know, hitting the bullseye uh, of being a clock angle and a distance. So I expected when I dropped my first one, I was going to hear a clock angle and a distance. And I pull off and uh, the, the guy uh, calls back shack. And I say to my instructor, I say, what's that? And he goes, smart Alec, except he didn't say Alec. Uh, but anyway, I go, no, I'm serious. I don't know what he means. And he goes, oh, it was a bullseye. You hit dead center. And for the, you know, that's not, for the first time I ever dropped a bomb, I'm kind of proud of that. But uh, yeah, there's a little twist to the story. Every time I would go in to release a bomb and the other ones, ah, they were off a little bit. Uh, the other ones, uh, you know, um, when I'm releasing it, I see my instructor's hand going up to the stick. And just before he's almost ready to grab it, I, you know, I release and pull off. And we get back and we're debriefing. And I'm thinking, man, this fighter pilot thing is fun, you know. And he's going, man, I, he says, you know, you were releasing right on the altitude you had briefed. And, you know, it just looks so darn low. And, of course, the thing is, you know, you got the release altitude and if you're going to release at 200 feet, uh, which is what you're supposed to release at, you're farther out from the target and you're higher. And if you come in to 100 feet, uh, not only are you lower, uh, but you're a lot closer. And so the, the air distance is really narrowed down. And I said, well, I took the ground elevation. I added 100 feet to it. And he goes, no, it's 200 feet. So, okay, that's one reason I was getting a little bit better accuracy. Um, and uh, I, I'll tell you, I, I continue that error too. It, it, it wasn't pretty, but uh, not on the bombs. Once I realized on the bombs, that was fine. But when we got to strafing, that was a little different. So, uh Okay, the A-10 comes along. I mean, the Warthog is a fantastic airplane. I chase this on uh, gun missions, on bombing drop missions out at Edwards. And, of course, this thing uh, was the follow-on. And it's, a, it's just an absolutely uh, great airplane with great capabilities and could take a lot more uh, than the uh, A-37 could. And it, it filled in that close air support uh, role that the A-37 did so very well. And it was just a cool airplane. And you look at that gun setting out there, the Gow 8. Now, there, there's the Gow 8 firing. And uh, we had a little problem out at Edwards where we lost one due to gun gas ingestion. What well, was a fireball, actually? They had a load of uh, um, propellant 
that was uh, had a problem and it caught on fire when it escaped and uh, they had a big diffuser for a while. Now I guess they got the problem solved. All right, so there's a picture of the A37 gun. It is a GAO 2B slash A. It fires a 7.62 millimeter round. Uh, it fires them at roughly 3,000 rounds a uh, minute, which is, is quite a few. Just one little bloop, and that's 100 rounds right there. Uh, and it will uh, uh, typically... You can carry up to 1,500 rounds, of course. When we went out to the range, we had a smaller load than that. But anyway, uh, the 7.62, well, here is the round that's used in the A-10. The 30 millimeter, oh, oh, sorry, 30 millimeter. It's got uh, high explosive here, and of course, here's the propellant charge. And you can take that 7.62, and we had just the bullet part of it, you know. Uh, we would go up to A-10s at air shows, and... Uh, hold it up to the muzzle. Uh, the bullet stood as high as the muzzle, essentially, on the A-10. Uh, that's uh, the comparison. This, 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 you'd, you'd rather have this. It'd do a lot more damage, you know, than 7.62. But it was good. Uh, it was it was a good tactical weapon. I, I joked that um, what we would do is we'd find a tank, and we'd go and we'd strafe it with a gun, and the guys inside the tank would hear plink, 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 like that, and they go, oh, what is this? Is there, is it, is it a storm? Is there hail? And they would come, and they'd open up the hatch on the tank, and then we could put the bomb right down the hatch, because uh, the you could be that accurate in the airplane. Anyway, that's Russ Stewart, one of the A-10 test pilots uh, out at Edwards there with a little uh, display of various munitions sites. All right. So there's the A-37. Now this guy has, uh, we called them bags of gas, they're tanks. Uh, we had the uh, wing tanks, the center tank, the tip tanks, and the pylon tanks. And I'll tell you about uh, a very high ranking uh, was, was going to be our commander who got a little trouble on that because you could screw up the fuel system. Also, it has a uh, refueling probe there, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Now, the A-10 truly... Uh, earned the patch there that's in uh on my hero wall there it's got a uh, it's got the a10 test team and that shows an axe going through a tank because when i chased this it was just like it was sh shredding whatever it was firing at all right the a37-1 and i'm going to tell you about this supplement there on the side too we had a little trouble with the seat belt uh issue of uh it, it had a new type and i'll show you a diagram of that and tell you what's going on there but uh, uh that killed our commander and uh, the new commander was a c-130 guy it was going to change over to a c-130 unit and they tried to teach a uh, trash hauler to be a fighter pilot and uh, i'm sure you can do it but in this case it did not work out well and there is the cockpit of the A-37. Now, to tweet drivers, you go, yeah, that looks a lot like, uh, and uh, except it's got the armament panel up there. And, uh, yeah, uh, for you guys flying the modern stuff with your nice flat displays and that, we had a lot of clocks. And there's the Dash 1. You can see where everything goes. Of course, it's all exploded there. Now there's the fuel system, and uh, you could get yourself into a problem here because you got the center tank, the uh, wing tanks, the tip tanks, and the pylon tanks. And if uh, if you ran the tanks, the uh, wing tanks dry, uh, you couldn't get the fuel out of the pylon tanks. And our um, uh, new commander had gotten into an emergency fuel situation, and we're sitting in the bar all wondering how could he have possibly gotten into that fuel state. And uh, finally, uh, we figured out the only way he could have done it is he didn't manage the fuel properly and burnt the wing tanks before he transferred the pylons. And uh, we're sitting there going, that's got to be it. His instructor uh, came in and we just said to into the bar and we just said, he didn't, did he? And he goes, yeah, he did. So fuel system could get you in trouble. And one thing I didn't like about the T or the A37 with these float switches, I had more problem with these float switches in the center tank sticking, and all of a sudden you got uh, a fuel emergency. I one time, uh, fortunately, was over a uh, Air Force base, um, I think it was Dias, when uh, uh, I had trapped fuel, and all of a sudden I was down to kind of minimum fuel, but it was, hey, it's right below me, I'll go in there and stop. So that worked out quite well. Oh, and let me tell you about the bomb sighting system. Uh, 
it was a mechanical device. There's a little, uh, you can see it down there, uh, that number two, uh, one or, yeah, my eyes aren't good, points to it. But you move that thing, and depending on what you were dropping in the dive angle, you set a mill uh, specification, and you could be super accurate. You know, this isn't like what the modern fighter pilots have now, where it's all computer generated and that. When you put the reticle, the little dot on your target, whether it's strafing or the bomb, you had to put in your own windage. You know, okay, where's the wind coming from? You try to figure it out, and then you offset it, you know, for the crosswind. And, of course, you had to make sure that you were perfectly aligned, that you didn't have any slip or skid in the aircraft, because that would screw everything up. So uh, it was a lot of good piloting, uh, pilotage and piloting that you had to do, or you would uh, not have very accurate results. So it was the old... You know, Kentucky windage on the uh, sights of the rifle sort of thing. And it was a lot of fun. Canopy breaker tool. Well, you guys probably know about this if you if you flew military airplanes. But, uh, you know, this is uh, more money than brains sort of thing. I'm up at Oshkosh, and a guy has uh, an A-37 up there. There are a few civilian ones. And uh, he is uh, he's trying to close the canopy, and he's, the battery has died on him. And I said, why don't we just declutch it? And he goes, what's that? And I said, you own this airplane? You don't know how to declutch the canopy? So I showed him how to do that. It's you got to be careful. Uh, you can get in trouble, you know, uh, get your fingers caught. But I show him that. And then I looked up in the canopy and I go, where's your canopy breaker tool? And uh, he goes, uh, what? And I said, there's a bracket up there. And what you see in the picture is canopy breaker tool. In case uh, you have an accident, an incident where the canopy, you can't open it or jet it, jettison it, you can use the a canopy breaker tool and you have the blade facing to you because it can glance away from you because of that curve of the blade. And otherwise, guys would come back and hit themselves in the head, and that's that's not good at all. So uh, you had to know how to use it, and you had to have one. So I looked at the guy, and I said, do you know the two ways you can kill yourself in the airplane? Um, and uh, uh, he kind of shook his head, and I go, man, who checked you out? Uh, not uh, It was not impressive, but... Here's the issue we had um, with with this seat belt, and this caused an issue out at Edwards too in a T38 because uh, they were they were going to these new seat belts. All right, it had this rotating thing, and uh, when the uh, during the ejection sequence, when the uh, you went through the ejection sequence and you need to separate from the seat, uh, a little gas charge fired, and this thing rotated and it released. Well. They had a little problem with that not working. And we had one guy, they had to do a controlled bailout, fortunately controlled bailout at high altitude, I mean 10,000 feet. Uh, and the uh, photographer in the back seat, his lap belt did not open. And he rode that seat down a very long time before it finally came to him that maybe he should turn that knob manually and release himself or he was going to hit the ground in the seat. Okay, there's the seat. And uh, there you see in the center there where all the straps come together that's where this little device is and i'll show you it here now what they had used before was um this uh the thing on the left there that old uh, uh latch that you hit in between the two little ball bearings there now the reason they didn't like this is people were catching their sleeve under that little lever there and they were releasing themselves from the lap belt so they went to this uh, round lap belt that you couldn't catch your sleeve on. Well, that was great, except it didn't always work. And our commander, uh, uh, the guy before I got to the unit, um, he had done a hard turn with the uh, A-37 at low altitude. And the thing is, with those engine intakes right near the front there, uh, if you do a hard turn, you can disturb the airflow and you can flame them out. They'll compressor stall and they'll quit just like that. And that's exactly what he did. He, uh, he did a hard turn. They both, uh, they both flamed out. There wasn't any way to get them restarted in time. Uh, so he punches out and it's a low altitude ejection. His lap belt uh, doesn't function and he hits the ground in the seat and is killed. Now, one other thing interesting about the A-37 is uh, we had a lot of power. We had uh, a thousand more pounds of uh, uh, thrust on one engine than the T T-37 had on two. So if we were going to go to a range somewhere that was a little bit of a cruising distance, we'd shut an engine down and we'd just fly single engine. And then when we got close, we restarted it um, uh, to conserve fuel. 
And the fun thing about being a fighter pilot is you have just all sorts of manuals uh, that cover weapons, tactics. We had our training manuals about how, to, how a formation approaches the target, maneuvers around. And there are just all sorts of things you can carry on the A-37 like most airplanes. So you open the manual and you got your uh, the thing you're going to drop there. And it says, well, you can put it on these stations. And then you got a few other uh, armaments. And you can put them on these stations. So it's all uh, very specific. Of course, the thing we used a lot were the, uh, the BDU-33s, the little blue bombs. They weighed about, I think, 25 pounds or so. They had a, a flash charge in them and a smoke charge. So you could sit there and you could uh, release them and then you'd look down to uh, see the smoke and you could see, uh, see where the bomb impacted. So uh, that was, a, that was a, 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 an easy way to um, you know, get some practice without dropping what we called heavyweights. Now, we... Uh, uh, you, you, you didn't typically drop live munitions that, uh, in peacetime. That was a very rare event. But what you would do uh, is you would drop heavyweights so you'd see the response of the aircraft, not only uh, to when the bomb was released, but uh, also what it was like just to fly it. So, uh, but this airplane could do a lot. It could carry high explosive, cluster munitions, uh, dispensers, unguided rockets, uh, napalm tanks, and uh, the Su-11-A uh, minigun pod. Now, like I said, they, they had 20 and 30 millimeter pods uh, that these were seldom, if ever, used. But anyway, that, that's the A-37. It was an easy, uh, close interdiction aircraft uh, to produce following on on the T. A lot of people were uh, very familiar with the systems. It, it went a lot uh, to, uh, smaller nations and stuff and went to the reserves and that, and like I said, you don't walk into a fighter by a fighter pilot bar and say, yeah, I'm a super tweet driver here. You're, you're just going to get, you know, blank looks like whatever. Uh, but anyway, it was a great, powerful little airplane for its class and, uh, just a lot of fun to fly. So anyway, I hope you found it interesting. Thanks for watching.